This video is for the aluminum and copper 2 chloride dihydrate lab, so make sure that you have your lab handout in front of you, that way you can follow along for each of the steps. So, starting with the first one, it says turn on the scale and take the mass of a clean dry beaker and watch glass. So I'm going to turn on the scale, make sure that it says zero, and then I take my clean dry beaker and watch glass. And this one weighs 91.17 grams. So I'm going to record that mass um, on the back. Oops. So where we have step uh, here. I don't know that you can see the cursor. Mass of dry and empty beaker and watch glass. So step one, we're recording our mass right there. So 91. 0.19 grams. Next, I have step two says set the watch glass aside and put your empty test tube into the beaker on the scale. So I have my clean dry test tube, or it's not really dry, we have some water in here, but I just rinsed this out and because I know the steps that are coming next, I'm not too concerned about getting this completely dry because I zero out the scale right now. So I have both of my pieces of glassware on there. It is zeroed out. I hit tear. And then I'm going to measure about 0.3 grams of my copper 2 chloride dihydrate. So that is coming from this beaker, but our original container has this on here. So what I mean by dihydrate, is it tells you right here that it is dihydrate because it is the copper 2 chloride salt that when it is in its solid form is actually bonded to two water molecules. So when you take the weight, that FW stands for formula weight, when you take the weight of this or the molar mass, um, you have to take into account the fact that it is kind of wet, that you have water bonded to your copper 2 chloride solution. So for us, that doesn't end up making a difference in terms of the actual reaction because the water becomes a part of the solution. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So I'm starting with like a pretty small scoop. Ooh, and that came out to 0 0.31 grams. So I'm going to write um, the mass of the solid copper 2 chloride dihydrate in step three, that is 0 0.31 grams. So then I'm going to take this off the scale, turn my scale off, and then I use just a little bit of water from my wash bottle. So I'm going to put some water in here, making sure to get all of the little crystals off the side. And that looks like a decent amount of water. So I will use my stir rod over here and dissolve that. So we continue to stir and make sure that all of our solid is dissolved. And then at this point, you can record your observations for your initial solution. So in step number on the back. So question two says, what color is your original solution? So our original solution is this one. So however you want to call that. And then the next one says, what is giving it this color? So if you're not sure what's giving it this color yet, you can leave that question blank for now. Um, and then we're going to take our aluminum wire. So I'm gonna scoot that back so you can actually see it. Don't need the scale anymore right now. So I have this aluminum wire, um, but the way that it's shaped is a tiny bit too big to be completely submerged. So I'm just gonna bend it so that I have almost like a hook shape. And then I'm just going to drop that right in and push it under. And there's like maybe a tiny, tiny bit sticking out, but we'll keep that right here. And then I'm gonna mix it up lots and lots to agitate it and kind of get my reaction started. So right away, you can see lots of bubbles forming. Um, and we'll talk about this when we look at the actual reaction. And then something else that I see is definitely a darker color forming, um, sort of like a rusty looking substance being formed. But it's really important for you to note that there is no iron present in any of this. So it would be incorrect to call this rust. It's not actually rust, it's just rusty looking. So we'll let that sit and continue to react for a little bit. I'll kind of keep that there. That way we can fill out our um, 
questions. So the first one says, write the balance equation for the reaction, including the states of matter, which should be observed in lab. So the first thing that I would write is that I used copper 2 chloride, so CuCl2. And then while the formula did actually have um, two water in it, like I showed before, because it's copper 2 chloride dihydrate, once I add water to it, it's actually just an aqueous solution, so you don't really need to write the H2O there. So I show that it's copper 2 chloride in an aqueous solution like that, and then what I added to it for the reaction to take place was Al, just solid aluminum, and that was that little piece of wire. And then when I have that compound of copper 2 chloride introduced to the single element aluminum, aluminum is going to try to replace the copper in the copper 2 chloride solution. So if I pull up my periodic table, let me see if I can get this to switch. Okay, so on my periodic table, as I switch down to my activity series, on the very bottom, or very close to the bottom, I have copper. And above this, I have, where's aluminum? There. So aluminum is a lot higher than, sorry, aluminum is a lot higher than copper on our activity series, meaning aluminum is more reactive and therefore would be successful at replacing copper in a single replacement reaction. So on my paper, I'm going to show aluminum taking the place of copper, and then I would have an aluminum ion bonding with a chlorine ion, so I need to re-crisscross their charges to form the correct compound. So AlCl3 plus copper is kicked out and left by itself. So I will leave that for you to balance on your own, and then you can also observe the correct states of matter based on what you see. So this has continued to react in the background. Let's go ahead and continue to agitate it. The reason we're doing this is so that the surface of the aluminum um, is clear for the reaction to continue to take place. If that copper forming on the outside of the wire is like blocking access to fresh aluminum, then the reaction will kind of slow down. So that's why the continual stirring, agitating. But you'll notice what you have at the bottom. If I put this behind it, maybe you can see a little better. The lighting is always a little weird. Okay, I feel like it looks actually the best like that. So we have this kind of rusty red color. That is the solid copper that's forming. So if you're looking at your reaction, that is this one. And then the aluminum chloride. If you use your um, periodic table again to tell what is soluble versus insoluble. So if I'm looking at this page, anything with a chlorine ion is typically going to be soluble unless it is bonded to silver or lead or mercury. Um, and so in this case, since I have aluminum bonded to chlorine, it is going to follow its normal rule of being soluble, which kind of points to the fact that um, my aqueous solution that I have here, this clear solution that's left over, is my aluminum chloride. So what tends to confuse students is that what we observe, first of all, there is a definite temperature change. If I feel this, it is warm. Um, and I see bubbles forming. So bubbles beyond just you know, me stirring the solution and getting it kind of mixed up. Um, but it is fizzing. There are definitely bubbles in here. I don't know how easy that is to see on the screen. Um, but that is coming from kind of just side reactions as a result of the materials that we're using. Since this aluminum wire is mostly aluminum, but maybe not 100% aluminum, there are other things reacting. So, continuing to stir this. It looks almost like it has maybe a bluish tint while it's sitting here, um, but in person it looks a lot more clear so I'm gonna let that just continue to react for a little bit longer um, so for the color of my original solution I would definitely say like a teal bluish color teal slash light blue And then what's giving it this color, I will leave that for you to determine. And then number three says, list two pieces of evidence that prove a chemical reaction took place and be specific about your observations. So I would say a temperature change for sure. Okay. 
And then I would say a new solid formed. We would call that a precipitate. Even though this is not a precipitate reaction, um, we do have a new solid that formed um, as a result of this reaction. So we could call that a precipitate. I think that the clearness of the solution is kind of translating a little bit better now. And then also a color change of the solution. It went from like the teal blue to now like a gray, murky clear solution. So if I let that sit without bothering it too much, once the bubbles kind of die down, I'm going to go ahead and say that it's clear. So new solid formed, that's still a number. Number three, one of my second observations, I'm going to say color change as well. And then number four says describe the appearance of the two products and determine their identities. Yes. So looking at the two products that are formed, I've got my rusty red looking stuff, that is my solid copper, and then my clear solution is my aqueous aluminum chloride. So clear liquid for aluminum chloride. So clear solution, T-I-O-N. So AlCl3 is my clear solution, and then my copper, my solid Cu, is rusty looking red. So there are a lot of different ways that you can describe this. Again, just make the distinction between rusty looking and actually calling it rust, because if it is rust, that's actually iron. Then it says, once your reaction has completely finished, after the full waiting period, what is the color of your solution? So here's where I would say that my solution is clear. I have no more blue so clear you could maybe say like foggy gray but that is pretty definitely clear so my reaction is like kind of slowly happening um, but what I'm seeing is like a tiny bit of bubbles my temperature change um, is not as significant anymore it is getting cooler so there's no more heat actively being produced it's kind of cooling down from what it was and then Part B says, what does this tell you about the chemical composition of the solution? Again, I want you to think about this. So think about in part two, what was giving your solution the blue color? And then what is gone from your solution? So if I have the absence of whatever gave it that blue color, that tells me that I no longer have that substance um, in question five. And then letter C says, based on what is left in your beaker, what is the limiting reactant? So this is kind of the main point of this um, lab. The question is, did all of my original reactants get used up um, or do I have something remaining? So if I'm looking at my aqueous CuCl2, my hint I guess is that this started as blue and my initial aluminum started as silver and while it might be kind of hard to see silver, I still have some of that aluminum wire at the end. So in my reaction, it's continuing and I have aluminum left in here. So it's covered in that copper still. That's why I keep mixing it around. But this wire that's still present did not get all used up and that wire was my aluminum. So that should tell you what your limiting reactant was. And then I'm going to go ahead and move on to part two. So we did all of this part, number seven, actively watching our reaction. We are pretty much done, at least with the actual reaction that's taking place. Like I said, there are some side things kind of happening. We don't really need to take that into consideration. I'm going to put my name on this. So when you put your name on your filter paper, always put it on the side. I write in pencil and I do it before I weigh it, just in case you use so much pencil lead that it actually changes the mass of your um, filter paper. So set it to zero. I have my name on it. I'm going to put it, I'm gonna do that better. So zero. And it says 0 0.72 grams was my mass of the filter paper. So zero point, oh, it went down, seven, zero. I'll weigh it a second time just to make sure. So 0 0.70, so we'll leave it at that. So I put that on the back. 
And then I'm going to go ahead and fill, fold this, sorry, according to the pictures that are in step nine. So fold it. I usually would fold it where my name would be like on the inside, like that. And then fold it again. And then when you unfold it, you'll have three strips on one side, so one, two, three, and then only one layer on the other so that there is no hole in the bottom. If you make it even and you have two and two, you end up with like a hole in there. Even if it doesn't look like it, it's easier for stuff to fall through. So that's why we do the three and one for our filter paper. And then we go ahead and put this in our funnel and then wet it so that it sticks. All right, so I set this up. That way we could see it on the camera. Normally you wouldn't want your um, funnel going that deep into it, but I know there won't be that big or that high of a water level, so it's not that big of a deal. So tiny bit of water just to hold the filter down in there. I'll lift this, that way you can see what that looks like. And then we're going to take our solution. So it's had even more time to just sit and kind of finish reacting. Even more obvious now that I have a clear solution and um, rusty red stuff. So then I pour this into my funnel that's lined with my filter paper and then this gets kind of stuck in the bottom so that's where you use your wash bottle. I'm also going to rinse off my stir rod with the squirt bottle right into there. So set that aside and then keeping this upside down I don't know that you can really see what's happening. Doo -doo -doo and just keep on rinsing it, being sure to collect everything in the actual filter part and don't let it get on the side of the funnel that isn't with the filter. So I'll show what I'm looking at in just a second. But at this part, it's really important not to use too much water because that would cause it to take too long to filter and too long to boil off the water at the very end. So this is perfectly washed out. There is definitely no more copper left in there. And then what I'm looking at is copper sitting in here. So then with the remaining um, aluminum wire that's in there, I'm going to use the tweezers to lift up the wire. So here's what that looks like. And then I'm going to take just a little bit more water and rinse off the copper. And get the copper off of there. So if I'm looking at this, there is like a tiny bit of copper still on there. If I hold this on the back, I wonder if that will show up better. So a tiny bit of copper left, but not a lot. So I'm going to dispose of this in the waste container. Definitely still some unreacted aluminum. All right, so here's what I'm looking at now. So the water slash clear liquid has all drained. There's a very minimal amount of liquid left down there. So I'm going to go to the lab handout and says, once your filtration is complete, carefully remove your filter paper from the funnel and unfold it. Use a piece of wire gauze to support the filter paper as you put it into the drying oven. Meanwhile, turn on your hot plate. So using this, I'm going to pull this up. That way I don't knock anything like that. I'm going to turn on my hot plate, hit the switch. Okay, so hot plate is on. I'm going to go ahead and just take my clear solution and put that onto the hot plate. Meanwhile, taking this out, carefully removing your filter paper from the funnel, and then I unfold this onto, so there's still some liquid in there, but it's no longer dripping. So I'm going to take this unfolded with my name side up and put that into the drying oven. So what I didn't show was I actually kind of smushed down and flattened the copper on the filter paper as I put it into the drying oven, just so that there was more surface area, um, hopefully to let it dry a little bit faster. Meanwhile, this is sitting here and we're still just waiting for it to boil. And once it starts to boil, I'm going to take my um, watch glass from the very beginning. So this little thing, I guess I could put it there right now. So we'll let that sit there. And the reason that we do that is so that if any of our... Um, 
solution starts to kind of like splatter out, we actually save that, collect it. So some students have pointed out that um, some vapor is escaping through there. That's the point. We're supposed to be evaporating um, the liquid off, and we're trying to collect the salt, um, or we're basically dehydrating the aluminum chloride solution that we produced here. So I'm going to just let this boil, and instead of letting the video run, I'll pause it and then restart it once we've actually like lost a significant amount of the liquid. All right, just a quick little check-in. It's definitely boiling now. We're getting a lot of condensation um, on the top up here. So what ends up happening is once this gets hot enough, we'll get some crystallization of our solid on there. So that's why we want the watch glass. But we can kind of force that liquid back down in there. So I'll let this keep on boiling. It's obviously going to take a little bit longer um, to completely dry out, but we want all of that water vapor to be gone um, when we actually take the mass of it. All right, while this is continuing to boil, I'm actually going to take you through calculating the theoretical yield of copper. So I set all of my classes up with, um, let me close that out. If I zoom out just a tiny bit on this, how's that look? Uh, Okay, that's better. So theoretical yield of copper, we're going to start with our actual um, amount of solid copper two chloride dihydrate. So this is what we measured out in step three. So the top thing in our data table um, up here, this number is what we're going to use to calculate our theoretical yield. So what that theoretical yield is telling us is that if we started with this amount of solid copper two chloride dihydrate, how much solid copper should we be able to make? So using that, I'm going to take our, our value oops, was 0 0.31 grams. So I'm going to put 0 0.31 grams of CuCl2, and then I'm going to put um, dihydrate, so 2H2O on there. Even though that's like a multiply symbol, really what that means is that you are adding the molar mass of two waters to it. So then we would set up our T-chart and I would use copper. So the molar mass of copper, my pen is stopping. Okay, so I would take 63.5 four six plus two times the molar mass of chlorine which is thirty five point four five and then I would add those together so I'm just pulling up my calculator here so two times thirty five point four five equals seventy point nine plus sixty three point Five, four, six. Sorry, I'm slow on this calculator. All right, so I got 134.446. So 134.446, that is the molar mass of just CuCl2. But when we took the mass of our solid copper two chloride, it was actually copper two chloride dihydrate. So I need to add to that. So I'm gonna hit plus the molar mass of two waters. So I'm gonna do two times 18.015. So that 18.015 is just the molar mass of water, but I happen to know it, so I'm using that to my advantage here. So then I got 170.476 as my molar mass of copper two chloride dihydrate. So 170.476, oops, my pen, 0.476 grams of CuCl2 2H2O um, use a scrub brush and then one mole of that same substance one mole CuCl2 2H2O I know this is messy um, and then what ends up happening is this is just acting like the CuCl2 from this equation. So at the beginning of the video when I explained why having this as your aqueous solution um, is basically the same thing as this, you have to take into account the mass with the water since that's how we weight it. But then from then on out, you can just use copper two chloride like you would have in the rest of the reaction. And then you're gonna continue on this to figure out the number of grams of Cu that you should have been able to produce, which is your um, theoretical yield. 
So meanwhile, our thing is still continuing to boil, boil, boil. It's taking a long time. I'm going to take my tweezers again and just um, like dump that into there carefully. Obviously, it's really hot. So again, the reason we're doing that is so that it will evaporate faster. The condensation is going to just sit on the top of the watch glass or on the bottom of the watch glass for a long, long time. Continuing to do this, and then something I wanted to point out on our reagent container is that we have this copper 2 chloride, and then for the formula weight that it has, it says 170.49. There is no unit listed on that, but that's what I said at the beginning. This is the same thing as the molar mass. Um, and so if we look at what we calculated, for our molar mass, we just had 170.476. Um, so that is just with our updated periodic table. So what I'm looking for when you calculate this based on my periodic table is for you to have every single one of those decimal places because we don't round molar mass. So I want to see that you actually took the time to calculate this. Um, but either way, what you can tell is that definitely they took into account the mass of the water here. So I'm going to sit, keep on letting this boil. It takes quite a while. All right, so we are mostly done with our water, so I'm going to turn our heat way, way down. And I have just a little bit, you can see some condensation on the top of our, um, or on the bottom of our watch glass. So I'm going to take the tweezers again, take that up, and then just kind of dump that into there to get all of that condensation out. And just let that sit and keep drying. Meanwhile, I did take this out of the drying oven so we have our um, dried copper so I'm gonna go ahead and take the mass of that while we're waiting for this to dry moving this over to the side so turning on the scale make sure that it reads zero of course I didn't weigh it originally on the um, wire gauze so I'm gonna put the wire gauze to the side and just weigh it on my filter paper and the mass that this says is 0 0.80. So I'm going to record that um, up here where it says mass of the filter paper and the copper product. So step 21, 0 0.80 is what I have right there. And then to figure out the mass of the copper product only, I would take the filter paper um, and subtract that from the mass of the copper and the filter paper. So this one's easy. I got 0 0.10 grams. Make sure that you keep the zeros on the end because that is important for your significant figures. We'll use that in your calculations and that's what we're going to be looking for. Um, and then the only other measurement that we are looking for is the mass of the beaker, the watch glass, and the salt product. So that's step 20. I kind of skipped ahead because my copper was dry and this one wasn't. There's still just a tiny bit of condensation, so I'm going to do the same thing again, picking this up. Drip that last little bit of water down. And then this is hot enough that I think actually the residual heat will actually finish drying it. So I'm just going to click off my hot plate, let that sit for a little bit. Um, after maybe another minute or so, I'm going to take that off of the hot plate and let it sit on the lab bench for a while. That way it cools down um, because we never want to put any hot glassware onto the scale for measuring. All right, so sufficient time has passed and this is definitely cool to the touch. Um, so the heat is not going to mess up my scale or affect anything like that. So I'm going to put my room temperature glassware onto the scale. And this says 91.28 is the mass that I have of my glassware and the product that's left inside of it. Okay, so the mass that I think it said a second ago was 91.28, um, but then I came back and tried to re-measure it because I got interrupted real quick. But if I put this on here, it says 91.31 now. So really anything in that range I would say is acceptable. This is just kind of a defect of our scales because they're not super precise. So we kind of just do our best, measure things multiple times that way. Um, you can get the best estimate, but 91.31 is what I'm going to go with for my final mass. But if you already wrote down, I think it was 0.28 before, um, that is fine. So at this point, the mass isn't changing, so we just go with whatever we can from the scale. So 91.31, and then I would take that answer, 91.31, minus my initial 91.19 grams of the empty beaker. Um, and watch glass, and that gave me 0 0.12 grams. I like that number better anyway because it would be like 
I don't know, a little over 50% yield if we went with our 0.28. So um, 0.12 is the difference that I calculated divided by my theoretical yield. And that gives me a much higher percent yield. Um, so make sure that you use these numbers to calculate and submit your papers.